OK, we'll kick off while a few people are still finding their seats and getting coffee. Fatu ngaro ngaro te tangata, toi tu te whenua. Hei oi anō, tēnā koutou, e ngā kaipu puriwaka. Ki ngā mate, kua rere atu ki te ārai o tua, haere, haere atu rā. Ki a tātou te hunga ora, ko au tēnei nō te waka o tainui, te iwi o raukawa ki te tonga, te hapu a ngā te kapu, te maunga a tararua, te awa o ōtaki. Ko Teresa tōku ingoa, ko o te rangatira kai whakahaere o Tuatu and Varakea. E mihi ana ki a koutou, no mai, haere mai, ki tēnei hui whakahirehire. Ko te hia hia he pai te akoranga hei awhina atu i tō mahi, nō reira, no mai, piki mai. Tēnā tātou katoa. Welcome. So to all of you here today, and I understand we've got about 300 people online, it's an absolute delight to welcome you all to today's event, helping you meet the climate-related disclosures regime, which is brought to you in partnership by Toy to EnviroCare and the Sustainable Business Council. It's a really important time for businesses working hard to meet the CRD legislation, and more than ever, climate change is on the New Zealand political, investor and consumer agenda. It's now impossible to talk about sustainability without fully disclosing progress and plans on climate change or run the risk of being accused of greenwashing. As you all know, the new disclosure regime requires us to go beyond regular finance accounting to also include carbon accounting. This is something we've been doing at Toy to EnviroCare for over 21 years now, enabling our clients to have visibility over their emissions uh, as we've worked with them to reduce over 8.4 billion tonnes of carbon from the atmosphere to date. So the purpose of us all coming together today is to provide a deeper understanding of the new XRB CRD standards, let you know how Toy to EnviroCare can support your business in relation to developing metrics and targets, and to provide an opportunity for you all to meet like-minded contacts and organisations. We've got an amazing line of speakers for you. Uh, we've got the Honourable James Shaw, Minister of Climate Change, uh, Dr Amelia Sharman, Director of Sustainability Reporting, and Misha Peters, Director of Assurance, both of whom are from the XRB, and our very own Austin Hansel, Carbon Product Manager here at Toy2. Uh, our speakers will be joining us for a Q&A at the end of the session, so please save your questions till then. Uh, and for those of you online, uh, please feel free to uh, put a, chat, uh, a question into the chat function. And we're also very cognizant that some of you may have some more audit-related or technical questions questions. Uh, so Toy 2's lead audit manager, Osana Robertson, uh, and our CRD product manager, Chelsea Jones, uh, will also be joining the Q&A panel. Uh, before we get started, um, for those of you in the room, a few obligatory housekeeping items. Uh, in the event that there is a fire alarm, just go back out the door to the right that you came through, round to the right, and then there's some stairs to go down and congregate outside espresso workshop uh, on the ground floor. Uh, and if you need the bathrooms, they are also uh, to the right and out the door. Uh, with a slight change in agenda this morning. Uh, James hasn't uh, arrived yet, so we're going to switch uh, to the presentation from the uh, XRB. So it's my absolute delight uh, to introduce you all to Dr. Amelia Sharman and Misha Peters from the XRB. Dr. Amelia is the Director of Sustainability, uh, and she's responsible for managing the execution and coordination of the CRD framework, uh, as well as the XRB's wider sustainability reporting work. Misha is the Director of Assurance, uh, has over 20 years of experience in audit and assurance standard setting, uh, and also heads the team that develops and issues auditing and assurance standards for New Zealand. Uh, a very big welcome to you both. Um, they're here to talk to us about the CRD standards, uh, what's required, and some latest updates. Thank you, ladies. Good morning, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Amelia Sharman toko ingoa, and I'm really excited to be here today, um, all the people online and the people in the room to talk to you about what we're doing. Uh, so, I know I probably don't need to do this part of the, the presentation, actually before I do this part, hands up if you actually know who the XRB is and what we do. Oh, 
Hi, everybody. Amazing. So, yeah, just a quick recap. We're an independent crown entity of about 30 people. We set audit, assurance, financial reporting, and now climate standards for Aotearoa New Zealand. We do a lot of engagement with international standards, um, but these standards are domestic, and I will talk a little bit about how we have aligned internationally. Um, but, yeah, why report on climate change? Yes, there is a legislative requirement. It's really important to get ready for the CRD regime that you know the requirements in the primary legislation. The standards have not replicated any of the requirements that sit in the primary legislation. So please do make sure that you are aware of what those are. There's, you know, there's bits around assurance, there's bits around making sure that your climate statements are, you know, there's a link in your annual report, for example. So yeah, have a look, part 7A um, of the Financial Markets Conduct Act 2013 is, is where you need to look. However, the standards, as well as having a legislative requirement, they enable two other really key things. Firstly, better decision-making by investors. It's really about shining a light, being transparent about the risk, climate-related risks and opportunities that an entity faces so that investors can make better decisions. But really importantly, we are clear that this is about better strategy by the entities themselves. And in paragraph two of all of the standards, you will find a purpose statement. The ultimate aim of Aotearoa New Zealand climate standards it is about moving to that climate resilient, low emissions future. This is really unusual in standards. Normally, they don't have that kind of purpose statement. We really want people to engage with this. Don't see it as a compliance exercise and you know, make changes in your business. So who's required to report? Most of you probably know this, but yes, we've got on the left, we've got our large list of debt and equity issuers, and then on the right, we've got our large financial institutions. We do have some crown, large crown financial institutions who will be required to report according to a letter of expectation from the Minister of Finance. That includes entities like ACC. Um, but in, you know, in here, I think there's some really, really interesting entities. You know, large listed debt issuers include Auckland Council, includes Kainga Aura. There will be some really, really interesting stuff coming out. And a really key message, if you didn't know it already, the standards were issued in December last year. They are live. They were effective from 1 January 2023. So if you are a January to December reporting year entity, your reporting period has started. Now, I cannot tell you what the record-keeping regulations are going to say. That is, MB and the FMA work together on those. But what I can highly, highly recommend is keep good records. You know, keep records of all those materiality judgments that you're making. Keep records of, you know, why you're, why you're thinking about what you're doing. There is no wrong answer. It's just about, you know, document that stuff. I, I can't stress that highly enough. So... Another key message I want to leave you with today is Aotearoa New Zealand climate standards are a package. They must be read together. They are secondary legislation. They all apply. All three of the standards have two parts to them. Well, sorry, they have three parts. They have the disclosure requirements, obviously very important, but then they have two other bits that I want to highlight. They have a set of defined terms these are really, really important because they are integral to the standard, which means they have the same legislative um, authority as the disclosure requirements. You'll see them in the standard as italicised the first time that they appear. Really get to grips with those uh, defined terms because they tell you, you know, what is expected under certain really key things. So what is a climate-related risk? What is a value chain? You know, what do we mean by that stuff? And then... Each standard has another thing called a basis for conclusions. This is not an integral part of the standard. It is not, does not have the same authority. It's like an essay where the XIB gets the chance to say, hey, we made all these decisions and this, this is why we made them. So if you're not sure about you know, what we were meaning and why we did what we did, you can have a read of that. Um, you know, if you're really struggling to get to sleep one night, pick that up. <laughs> So the three standards, Aotearoa New Zealand Climate Standard 1, climate-related disclosures. This is the sexy one. This is the TCFD-based one. It's where you've got your governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets disclosures. 
It's also where the scope of the mandatory greenhouse gas emissions assurance comes. So primary legislation stated that any greenhouse gas emissions disclosures needed to be assured for periods ending on or after 27 October 2024. What we did, we, you know, we worked really, really hard to get those standards issued by last year because what that means is, in practice, everyone will get one year of issuing a climate statement before the greenhouse gas emissions have to be assured. You can get your greenhouse gas emissions assured now, obviously, but you don't have to legally until your second statement. Aotearoa New Zealand Climate Standard 2 is we heard throughout the consultation process that some of this stuff is just quite challenging and we needed to give people a little bit more time to get ready. So there are seven what we're calling adoption provisions in that standard which you, are, you, you can use, you do not have to use, you can use one, you can use a combination, you can use none. They are under three areas. Strategy, so for example, transition planning. You can have a one-year exemption from doing the transition planning disclosures. They are under other metrics and targets. Scope three, greenhouse gas emissions, you can have a one-year exemption. I would point out the scope three, greenhouse gas emissions adoption provision means that you can have an exemption from disclosing some all of your scope three. If you are already disclosing some of your scope three greenhouse gas emissions, you can still do that and use that adoption provision to not do your full scope three. And then there are comparative uh, information disclosure um, exemptions. So obviously I, we can't make you disclose comparative information if you haven't been collecting this information. So, you know, there's one to two years of, of having the time to get that information ready. And then three general requirements. This is my favourite standard, very important. Please read this one carefully. It is where the, um, all the principles for disclosure sit, um, and I will get into some of those in a bit more detail. Um, but yeah, as I said, climate-related disclosures, scope one. I'm not going to go through all of these here. Very happy to answer questions on the specific disclosure requirements. Um, you know, I, I, what I would like to say is that we stayed very aligned to the TCFD in terms of the TCFD's main recommendations. We also had significant um, attention to what's happening at an international level. Some of you might know about the International Sustainability Standards Board and their proposed standards. So we have been keeping a very close eye on what they're doing. Some of the decisions that we made after our exposure draft and the decisions that they have made after their exposure draft have brought us all closer together. Um, so for example, um, scenario analysis, they in their exposure draft were proposing alternatives to scenario analysis like point in time forward you know, forecasts. We very, very strongly you know, submitted against that and we're really pleased to see that they have taken that out of their proposed standard as well. Um, but you know, very close to the TCFD, we've written this purposefully in a very succinct, high-level manner. The point is so that every entity can see themselves in these disclosure requirements, talk about what they're doing, where they're at. Um, and then, you know, if you're more ambitious, you can talk a lot more about what you're, what you're doing. As I said, these are the adoption standards. Um, you can use, so basically the hard things, we give you a year off. Um, the comparatives, they come, they come on in. Um, one thing I would say, if you do use your scope three greenhouse gas emissions adoption provision, um, the first time you then report will be subject to assurance. So I highly recommend if you want to use any of these adoption provisions, do the mahi inside your organisation, do, do the reporting, even if you don't disclose it, because it will put you in a really good position to disclose um, come your second year. And then, yes, general requirements. So I'm going to make you all love this standard by the end of my talk. Um, so this has this overarching principle of fair presentation. What do I mean by fair presentation? We say in the standards that we think all the disclosure requirements that we have put in, 
are presumed to result in information that provides a fair presentation of an entity's climate-related risks and opportunities you know, to the primary user, primary users being existing and potential investors, lenders, and other creditors. However, if there is something that is not listed in the disclosure requirements that you would need to talk about in order to provide a fair presentation of your entity to your primary user, you must disclose that. So for example, you are an entity, you're about to buy you know, a, coal, you know, a coal mine, for example, um, not very likely in New Zealand, but something, you know, imagine that. You wouldn't, but you know, it hasn't come through yet, but it's very close. And you, you would need to disclose that fact um, because that would be fair presentation. If you were putting your climate statements out saying that, oh, you know, my scope emissions are really low, and but actually something is happening in your entity or something is not specified in the disclosure requirements, you know, you need to put that in. It does require judgment, but you know. We're really asking you to think, if, if I have something going on in my entity that is not specified in these disclosure requirements, what might I need to say? There are these principles for information, principles for presentation. If you are an accountant, you might recognise those as qualitative characteristics. We've drawn those from the TCFD and other sources. We've designed, we've written those, we hope, in plain English. We can see if we pass that plain English legislative test. Um, and there are examples in there specific to climate-related disclosures. So hopefully you'll find all those very useful. And then these general requirements. There is a lot, there are requirements in this standard. So, for example, and I will talk a bit about value chain and scenario analysis next. But what I really wanted to highlight is, you know, you need to know what we say about where you can disclose. Um, your reporting entity and reporting period is the same. You know, if you are doing, for example, your emissions and you do those on a different reporting period, for example, for the ETS or for ENGA's registration, um, requirements in Australia, you can't report them on a different period than you report them for your financial statements. Um, obviously, so there's materiality, there is a definition of materiality in there. One message I would leave you with is that materiality applies to all of the disclosure requirements. What do I mean by that? If there is some, if there any of the disclosure requirements, if you, in your judgment, think that that information is not going to be material to your primary user, you need not disclose it. So if your primary, if you, in your judgment, think that your primary user couldn't care two hoots if you have an internal emissions price or not, you just would not disclose that fact. You just wouldn't disclose the information. And it is not a comply or explain regime. You don't have to put, it, you don't have to put in your statements whether or not you, you know, why you've made that call. You might wish to do that. Um, but as I, you know, hark back to those record-keeping requirements, if you're making those materiality judgments, I highly recommend that those are documented uh, somewhere. There are a lot of um, requirements here around methods and assumptions and estimation and uh, data and estimation uncertainty. We heard during the consultation period that that was really, really important for entities to be able to have a chance to talk about that stuff. Um, it is specific to some of the disclosures. So, for example, we have some very specific stuff relating to scenario anal analysis. Um, but really there it's about... The, the investors want to see, they want to be able to compare as much as possible and by providing that transparency about the methods that you've used and the assumptions, that gives a bit more transparency to your user. So, the, as I said, the, principle, the standards are written in a very concise, short, they're actually, you know, NCCS1 is only five pages, which is very, very short for a, a reporting standard. Um, so what we realise is we, you know, we need to provide a bit more guidance. This guidance is not secondary legislation. It is staff guidance. It does not have the same authority. Really, we're trying to be helpful, show you a way, not the way, to do the disclosures. The staff guidance is written very much about, here's what we think your primary user wants to know, here's a bit more information, and here are some, you know, to direct to kind of page references in TCFD and other guidance to help you. We're not in the business of rewriting TCFD guidance. We just want to point you in directions if that's helpful. 
So we've already put um, lots of this stuff out, some very short, um, short, some short, some longer. We put out guidance for all sectors and guidance for our MIS managers, our fund managers, as part of the exposure draft. We've got heaps of useful feedback on that. And we are busy, literally at the moment, you know, getting that in a position where we want to issue at the beginning of May, um, reissue those documents. And then we will also be issuing more guidance this year. Um, so lots on scenario analysis, specific guidance for banks and insurers. We want to work collaboratively with both the banks and insurers on that and, you know, with the Reserve Bank because there's, you know, there are a lot of overlapping requirements in that space. Um, and then on transition planning, it's going to be coming out. So keep an eye on the XRB website. We'll, you know, follow us on LinkedIn. We, it's, always, it's always coming out. Um, I'd like to talk about two things specifically, value chain and scenario analysis. So in NZCS3, remember that's my favourite standard, um, there is a requirement, paragraph 22, which talks about an entity must consider the exposure of its value chain when it thinks about its climate-related risks and opportunities. And your value chain does include things like joint ventures, you know, and associate things, investments that you have in other entities. Value chain is a defined term. It's quite a long defined term, but it, this is the beginning of it. Um, you know, the full range of activities, resources, and relationships. So it's quite, you know, we're really saying you can't just think about your entity as an island. Your entity is part of a value chain, and a lot of your risks and opportunities might lie outside your entity and in your value chain. So... What could you, you know, to start with, we're saying you need to think on a reasonable time frame. We're not going to specify what that is. Um, you, you just disclose that. What are the risks and opportunities sitting for you in your value chain? So these might be transition risks. You know, maybe you have a significant operation and, you know, or your product coming from another country. Are there going to be um, emissions taxes coming in there, for example? Or is there going to be new stuff happening elsewhere? And then are there physical risks and opportunities in your value chain? This might be a bit easier to imagine, you know, is, is there going to be supply chain disruptions to you? Um, and you then, you know, there are current and anticipated financial impact disclosures. Think about all these risks and opportunities in your value chain. What are the financial implications to you of, you know, this stuff happening potentially currently in your current period and then what might happen to you? The value chain disclosures are also relevant for your scope one, two, and your scope three greenhouse gas emissions disclosures. So the standard requires full scope three greenhouse gas emissions disclosure, obviously subject to a materiality overlay. So if you know if you don't have if you don't have I know you can you can't possibly read these, but you know if you don't have leased assets, if you don't have um, you know if you don't sell a product, you know, obviously those those categories uh, don't apply. The XRB has not specified which measurement standard you can use to identify your greenhouse gas emissions. You can use ISO series, you can use greenhouse gas protocol, you can use some of the more specialised ones like PCAF for your financed emissions. All you need to do is disclose, you know, which standard you've, you've used. Um, but obviously I'm preaching to the converted here. If you haven't started measuring your emissions, I highly recommend that you do so. Uh, and then... The second thing is scenario analysis. This is the one that freaks a lot of people out, but really it is, we have stayed very, very true to the TCFD view of scenario analysis. It is about testing the resilience of your entity's strategy under a range of plausible future outcomes. The analogy we use is, it, imagine your strategy is an aeroplane. You don't just test your aeroplane in perfect blue sky conditions. You test it in a, you know, in a wind tunnel at the extremes. And that is what this scenario analysis exercise is designed to do. So we have a 1.5 degree, a 3 degree or greater, and then a third scenario of your choosing. One thing I would say in that basis for conclusions, remember that essay, we do point out you know, that in the TCFD world... If your scenario analysis does not show you that your business model and strategy needs to change because of climate change, it probably doesn't meet that TCFD criteria 
of plausible, rigorous, you know, and challenging enough and coherent. So really, in a nutshell, if you're, if you're doing the scenario analysis and it's telling you that everything in your business is A-OK -okay and you can just, you know, poodle along as you're going, you're not doing it right. So what we have done in hearing that that's actually really hard is thinking about how we can help. And the way we are trying to help here is encouraging entities to get together at a sector level to construct scenarios collaboratively. So we really don't want this situation on the left where everyone takes, you know, doesn't know how to translate down from those global um, climate and socioeconomic pathways. They're making completely different assumptions. It makes it very, very hard to achieve that second objective of the standards, which is, you know, better decision making by investors. So we think that doing it collaboratively at a sector level, it's not a requirement of the standard. We just think it's helpful will lead more towards the situation on the left where there is more consistent um, interpretation of those things and consistent assumptions being made both within and across sectors. So what have we been doing to encourage that? So um, we, we were really lucky that in 2020, the marine sector did a collaborative scenario analysis process um, and got in my team the guy who led that. Uh, so we developed some guidance um, about doing it collaboratively at the sector level, and then there was just a lot of phone calls, a lot of phone calls to the leads of, you know, various sector peak bodies, various entities, you know, we knew who were climate reporting entities saying, hey, we think this is a good idea, we think it's going to cost you a whole heap less money than all going it alone, we think it's going to be easier for you. And so we then um, convened, we've also convened a forum of leaders who are doing this work, and the XRB is committed to supporting a community of practice around sector level scenario construction. And very excitingly, most of the sectors have said, yeah, that's a wonderful idea, we'll totally do that. Um, so some have completed their scenarios, some are very close to completing, some are more, you know, and they're getting started. We're encouraging all of the documentation to be on the, X, you know, we'll host it on the XRB website. But I, you know, I cannot overestimate this point that, you know, this, the value in scenario analysis is not the artifact. It's not the report that comes out at the end. It is the doing. It's, you know, the TC, TCFD calls it these movies of the future. It's about being in the room being imaginative and thinking about, okay, what, would the, what could the future look like for me? Having that really kind of qualitative, exploratory process. And all of this is designed to lead into transition planning. So uh, notice I did not say transition plan. We are not intending that there is this separate, lovely transition plan that sits here off to the side of your entity's strategy. Transition planning should be an aspect of your core strategy. There is a definition, again, definitions, and we have ensured, we really want to make it clear that transition planning in this context is both about mitigation, so a low emissions future, but it's also about adaptation and resilience, so this climate resilient future. It's about how your entity is going to change to become you know, both more climate resilient and you know, appropriate in a low emissions future. We will be putting out guidance on that, as I said. So that's everything from me. Really looking forward to your questions, and I'm very pleased to pass over to my colleague, Misha. Kia ora, everybody. It's excellent to be here. My name is Misha. I head the team that, le that writes the assurance standards. So what we are really passionate about is ensuring trust and confidence in reported information, and we're hearing increasing uh, concerns about the risk of greenwashing in the context of climate statements. So let's first have a look about what builds, oh, wrong way, what builds trust and confidence in information. So there's four factors, they're in the grey circles. Firstly, you need a sound reporting framework from the XRV and Amelia, we think we've got one of those, so that's good. Step two is having sound governance. So at your organisation, and as Amelia said, we hope you're busy documenting everything. That's the first step. You might get some internal controls over this reporting process. You might have an internal audit function over this process. 
you might be engaging external expertise to assist you on some of this complicated uh, disclosure matters. That builds trust and confidence internally so that you have confidence in the report that you put out in the public. But how does external users have trust and confidence in that information? It builds on those two factors. But step three is they go, okay, is what you're reporting consistent with everything else that I'm hearing about your organization? And then step four, the last line of defense, and it builds on these other four, three factors, is external independent assurance. Now, given the importance of climate reporting and the nature of climate reporting entities captured within this regime, under the law, it's mandatory for some of the information to have independent external assurance. So let's have a look at where we're at. As uh, Amelia's highlighted to you from December 30, 31 December 23, that's when we're going to have the first climate statements prepared. It's not required under the law to have anything assured at that point. Moving forward, we get to October 2024. It's an unusual date. But what we're really seeing is we're going to have a time lag of a year before you get the mandatory assurance over greenhouse gas disclosures in your climate statements. So it's a micro-assurance engagement over a small part of your climate statement. The assurance story doesn't stop there because it's still kind of under construction. MB and MFE recently consulted on two matters, one being to establish the oversight regime over the assurance practitioner, and they're proposing that that kicks in from 2027. They're also proposing to expand the scope of mandatory assurance so that by 2028, the full climate statement might be subject to mandatory independent external assurance. So in summary, what you can see is there's a time lag. You've got the reporting going ahead and assurance traveling behind it. And that's intentional for two reasons, to allow climate reporting entities time to get their systems and processes and documentation in a, into a mature state ready for assurance. And it also, of course, allows assurance practitioners time to prepare for this work. So what we're busy with at the, at the XRB <clears throat> at the moment is preparing the assurance standard for the greenhouse gas aspect, because that's the bit that's mandatory under the law and it is mandatory that that assurance engagement is undertaken in accordance with XRB standards. So it is also has the force of law. The three aspects that have to be assured from 2024 will be those scope one, two, and three emission disclosures, plus all the attached disclosures that go with those around measurement methodologies, assumptions, consolidation approaches, what's been excluded, so you can find the detail of what has to be assured in NZCS1, but it's summarised here. Two key things to note. XRB has set disclosure standards. We have not set the measurement standards. The measurement standards are a fundamental part of an assurance engagement, so it's really important of those, that disclosure around what measurement methodology you've used. The other key thing to note is, is that the legislation is silent on the level of assurance. So XRB has clarified that the minimum level of assurance here is limited assurance. Not many people understand the difference between limited and reasonable assurance. It's a spectrum. And what we're saying here and, and what users will see for limited assurance is a negative opinion. Nothing has come to my attention that indicates that this is not materially uh, reflected. That's not to say that organisations may not voluntarily seek reasonable assurance, and in fact they might get a mixture of assurance, having limited over its parts, probably the scope three, and then reasonable over scope one and two. 
So briefly, I want to talk to you about our developing assurance standard. We're on consultation at the moment, seeking views on this. I'm presuming there's not many assurance practitioners in the room, so I'm not going to bore you with the detail of what the assurance practitioner has to do. But we're really keen to get your views about assurance because there's a couple of things happening under these proposals. Firstly, we cover the engagement requirements. And our objective here is to make sure that we are casting the net wide to capture as broad a range of assurance practitioner as possible. This is new. We need the right people doing this work. So we need to make sure that they are competent in both assurance and greenhouse gas measurement and reporting. So we are requiring the assurance practitioner to comply with one of two well-used international standards in New Zealand, either the ISO or a standard issued by the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. On top of that, we are proposing to require additional reporting requirements for assurance practitioners. Our objective here is to enhance the communicative value for users. So from a preparer's perspective, you might want to think about those proposals and have a think about whether you have any concerns about our proposals and the additional reporting that we're requiring from an assurance perspective. The two other aspects are on ethics and quality management. Key, key, key point to think about here is if you're engaging an expert to help you prepare your information, our proposal is, is that would then prevent that, it, that individual from later assuring that work. Trust and confidence is enhanced. We know that users trust independent assurance. So the assurance practitioner cannot assure their own work. So that's really it from me on assurance. If you've got any thoughts, we're really keen to hear from you, either on greenhouse gas assurance or on the expansion of the scope of assurance, the level of assurance, who should be doing this work. Our details are up here. We're only a phone call or an email away, so please do get in touch. And our submissions on the greenhouse gas closes on the 24th of March. So that's it from Amelia and me. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you this morning. Follow us on LinkedIn, subscribe, keep up to date. It's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amelia and Misha. A um, couple of uh, key takeaways for me from that. Um, the standards are about enabling a better understanding uh, uh, and decision-making by investors and organisations, uh, but also about enabling better strategy setting by organisations. Um, important that there is a clear statement of purpose. It's not just about compliance. Uh, make sure you keep records. Uh, um, uh, as to how you've arrived at your decisions and judgments. So, um, uh, as Amelia stated, there's no wrong answer. It's just important that you document everything uh, in terms of how you arrived at your decisions and your conclusions uh, so that if those are ever challenged, um, you can very clearly uh, point to why you arrived at that particular conclusion. Um, I was very heartened to hear that we've got a sexy standard <laughs> uh, in climate standard number one um, uh, uh, and, and went on to talk about fair pre the importance of fair presentation, uh, disclosing material facts uh, and expectations. So make sure that um, you're not just disclosing what's going on in your business right now, but anything that you expect um, to happen or foresee happening um, the, in the foreseeable future. Uh, we then went on to uh, Mesh's four steps. Um, uh, so the, in relation to assurance, so making sure that there's a, a sound reporting framework, uh, sound governance, um, that your reporting is consistent with market perceptions uh, of your business, uh, and then the independent assurance piece, and limited versus reasonable assurance, uh, and the limited assurance being um, nothing has come to my attention that will cause me to believe, etc. Uh, and I think the most important piece about um, uh, the insurance is that it must be independent, um, as I'm sure that most of you already know. 
So on that note, uh, it's my absolute delight to introduce you to Austin Hansel, um, our uh, Toy Two's Carbon Product Manager. Um, Austin's got over a decade of experience with Toy Two uh, and currently looks after our climate programs uh, to ensure that businesses are able to make real science-based progress. Welcome, Austin. everyone. Uh, really good morning so far and really appreciate hearing directly from the horse's mouth. It's always really good. Um, right, so this is work we need to do. We know this. There's been a lot of research to help indicate that you and your fellow executives agree this is the right thing to do. And the real question comes down to how. How do we do this? And that's where we're going to start the conversation today. We only have 15 minutes. We will not answer all of your questions, um, but we will hopefully answer a few more questions in just a little bit. Now, before I dive in too far, in case you aren't that familiar with us, uh, we're from Toy2 EnviroCare. We're a purpose-led organization. We're a subsidiary of Minaki Fenua, a New Zealand government-owned research institute. Um, we hold fast to those roots in science. We are a business, but we're a purpose-driven one. Everything we've done for the last 21 years is about catalyzing climate action. And all of our profit is reinvested back into the business. That revenue is just about how do we expand our impact? How do we have more impact? Our roots in science mean that we put a lot of value on standardization, proof points, validation. Um, we seek external validation to show that we are what good looks like um, for how we run our operations the services we provide, how we ensure that we remain impartial and independent, uh, the way we look after our people and communities, the way we collaborate, and some of these are on screen here. We also have a seat at quite a few key tables to ensure we're helping to guide where global standards and guidance are going and what's coming on that next horizon. We're not just about the theory, though. Um, since 2001, we've verified over 3,300 greenhouse gas uh, inventories. That means looking at business activities and operations that have generated uh, over 265 million tons of emissions. Um, we take that direct experience with the lead practice with our clients, and we're able to use that to kind of help guide the climate ecosystem, making sure that we're relevant, we're valuable, we're credible. Uh, working with us gives you a direct channel into that collective. We work with over 80 CREs already, and over 800 organizations across all sectors here in New Zealand and overseas. So we're very likely already in your sector, in your value chain, and we can help you facilitate those connections to create some of that, you know, the sectoral discussions on what do our risks look like collectively. Um, let us, you know, sort of help you ensure that standardization, comparability, and while you're shoring up those risks, you can do that in a really collaborative way. And the collaboration can be really key. As our collective grows, so does our investor, director, and consumer awareness. Part of that building awareness are the growing number of company ads, uh, annual reports, product packaging that you might be seeing our marks on. And these companies are making claims substantiated by our endorsements, particularly those of the Toy2 Carbon Certification Programs. Those programs are really tried and tested. We've been doing them in some form for over a couple decades now. And we found that our clients are reducing by an average of 38% over their first five years of membership with us. That 38% means cost savings, efficiencies, resilience, innovation. Um, and it also means they're doing their fair share. How do we hit our collective 1.5 degree goal? Joining the collective lets you tap into our networks, accelerate your action, and solidify your leadership. Climate action is about understanding your current and your potential risks, your uh, vulnerabilities, your impacts, and then developing plans. How will you mitigate your exposure? How can you maximize opportunities? Those principles probably feel fairly familiar to you from financial working, um, you know, business cycles. But 
as always, the devil is in the details. And in fact, at an event last month, um, Jaco Moisen, the FMA head of audit for financial reporting and climate disclosures, he said that financial reporting is easy compared to climate statements. Um, it's those details. Uh, it's about knowing what are the best sources for data, how do you calculate it and turn it into emissions, what are the methods that work best for you, especially as you're getting further out into that value chain, those scope threes. Um, uh, many executives have reported that one of the key barriers they face is around that specific capability. Having the climate skills or knowledge, understanding what good looks like in that climate space. Lead practice can feel like it's ever changing. So how on earth do you know that you've gotten it right this time? That barrier can hit you whether you're a mandated entity, whether you're choosing to voluntarily align with this practice. Um, many actors in this space agree that this regime is likely to extend in the future. Um, you might be hit by similar regulation here overseas. Either way, uh, working with a climate expert, a climate assurance expert like Toy2 can help ensure that you're fully compliant with the climate related disclosures with whatever lead practice might come your way. Pulling in a climate expert is really, it's that best way to lift that barrier, but particularly a climate expert who will upskill you and let you build that capability in-house, um, build those internal systems and processes so you're owning the work. It's work that you're doing. We're just a guide on the journey. Uh, no matter if this is stuff that you're already fairly advanced on um, or if you're really just starting out and you're not even really sure where to start, Wherever you are in that spectrum, on that journey, we can help meet you there and help point you in the right direction from your next steps. Uh, we can lead you in the right direction for positive change. It's whether you want uh, your work assured, if you want to upskill your teams, if you're just looking for good frameworks to align with and you need a bit of guidance there. As with any strategic work, the job is never done. This is really about continual improvement. And Amelia touched on this, but it's really like emphasizing that this is something you will keep building. You're never going to get it perfect in the first go. It's something that you're going to build over time. And that's embedded in the standards themselves. But there are a few timelines to keep in mind. So while you're building out this roadmap, it is about that continual improvement. But in the near term, there's a few things that you're going to want to use to prioritize your plans and, um, and keep in mind. So we've talked on a few of these this morning already. Um, the climate standards are now released. The first periods have started as of January. Ahead of us are those consultations around the record keeping guidance. Um, and uh, we're also still awaiting the standards around uh, assurance, which we are watching very closely as our other providers so that we're ready to deliver exactly what you need for that compliance. But even without some of those pieces that are still to come, it's, uh, this work does take most organizations several years to really find your feet and really mature. It's about doing what you can today and doing a little bit better tomorrow, every day. Those first climate statements that are going to be released from January next year, they're that first step on the journey. That journey, um, that first step is really the most critical point, and that's going to really start with getting your baseline. Um, think about your baseline as a bit of a gap analysis. So looking at, um, looking at your baseline climate numbers, what are the impacts that you're having right there? Starting to map out that early risk assessment. What are the risks and opportunities that are facing you now that will be facing you as our climate continues to change? How does the climate touch you and how do you touch it? That's effectively that baseline gap analysis. And from there, as you develop it, as you go through it, you'll identify even more opportunities and you'll start to find those early quick wins, build some rapid proof of action to really build further engagement and momentum across your teams and it can cascade from there. The, the key is that you're getting that data that you need in order to make data-driven decisions and then that's how that flows upward. You can plan that informed action, look at how it makes sense to start embedding climate into your existing processes, where your wider strategic and operational um, roadmaps and decision uh, tables, where do you need to put these decisions in so that climate has a seat at the right tables at the right moments.
then it's an annual cycle. You're monitoring what works, what needs improvement, those initial proof points and those early projects will just cascade from there as your team builds on its success. And as you build up those annual cycles, uh, Toy2 can point you toward what good looks like. Um, uh, we can upscale your people, we can audit and assure your work, um, we can provide you with the support that you need to create your climate disclosures, but it's all work that you're doing and we're just guiding you there or checking in. Our carbon certification membership package can tick all those boxes for you. Membership includes access to a dedicated technical expert, account management, an ever-expanding library of guidance, of tools, templates, worked examples, training sessions, so that your team can really build this skill set. Uh, it includes an independent audit from our auditing business unit, resulting in a statement of compliance to the aspects of New Zealand Climate Standard 1 that sit within the program. You also get an annual verification report, assurance statement, a full inventory report of your greenhouse gas emissions in line with, um, we use the ISO greenhouse gas accounting standards, which are a fully allowed pathway under this work. Now, if your team is already well in its way, you don't need that full level of support, you've already found your feet, um, we can also just be your assurance provider. Um, we, um, I mentioned earlier the fact that uh, in some ways, uh, finance is easy compared to climate, and I think our auditors would uphold that fact. We have several financial auditors who now um, are, work in our auditing business unit doing climate statements, auditing climate statements, and I think they'd really attest to that fact. Um, but no matter what, an audit with us results in an assurance statement, a full verification report, your full verified inventory, and a statement of compliance to those aspects of the NZ Climate Standard 1. If you're in those earlier planning stages and you're looking at where to from here, you'll be needing to make some calls on the methodologies that are the best ones for your situation. And this is where we really recommend leading on climate subject matter experts who have experience across that full range of frameworks, standards, methodologies to really be able to point you to the ones that are most appropriate for you at this moment in time. So that might mean that you use um, the ISO 14064 part one or greenhouse gas protocol for your main emissions. But if you have financed emissions, for example, you're absolutely going to want to use PCAF, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financial Standard uh, for that group. It's by, by far agreed to be the best appropriate standard for that group of emissions, um, not only by us, but by uh, globally, you know, groups like the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, Science-Based Target Initiative, uh, the CDP, the TCFD, and of course the XRB. Um, you, there's a lot of other components to this space as well. You might have other things that are coming your way. You might need to be considering doing a, a validated science-based target. Uh, you might be reporting into the CDP, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, one of a, a global partner potentially, um, submitting your progress statement to the CLC on the latest statement of ambition. Using a climate expert who has experience across all of those methodologies and frameworks will really help your organization seamlessly report, build all of those things into one sort of straightforward process that lets you tick all of those boxes. Our membership programs can go a long way towards helping you hit all of those objectives. And we spoke at the beginning, one of the biggest barriers that's been reported by executives is that capability. And if that's the thing that's really facing you hardest right now, um, we can help with that as well. We run a lot of bespoke workshops. We can work with full teams, small groups. We also have sessions that are tailored for executive level and board of directors. And that you might find that that actually will help you tick some of the governance requirements under the XRB standards. Our services uh, can be tailored to fit your needs now. We can continue to fit your needs as they evolve as you mature along your journey going forward. We think that these standards are gonna go a really long way to supporting organizations, understanding where they are now, the risks that they're facing, and developing data-driven strategies to really create a transformational business model. You will remain competitive, relevant, profitable in the years to come by doing this mahi. We think it's really important. The CRD standards, it's a real opportunity to play a key role in catalyzing action, to building the resilience that your organization might face 
from this regulation, from regulation to come, and of course from the impacts in our changing warming worlds. Take this in stages. If I can leave you with nothing else, it's about a journey. Please continually improve. Just do the best you can with the information you can now. Document it very thoroughly and just keep trying to do better. As you, the more you do now, the more it will reveal the next steps for you. Build on those annual successes. Use the metrics and targets to really anchor and steer that wider strategic work across your full business and ensure that you guys are able to add so much value to your businesses. We're ready to support you, whether it's compliance or beyond. Take positive steps with us. Kia ora. Thanks very much, Austin. Uh, just conscious of time. So um, it's now my absolute pleasure to introduce you to the Honourable James Shaw. Uh, probably needs no uh, introduction. Uh, as Minister of Climate Change, he's focused on specific measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the transport, energy and agricultural sectors. Welcome, James. Uh, good morning. Thank you for coming out on your Friday morning to um, uh, talk about compliance. I'm <laughs> sure that really floats your boat. I was just reflecting that uh, when uh, we first consulted on this uh, about four years ago, um, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see that 89% of respondents from the business community uh, came back and said, actually, we, we think that we need a mandatory uh, reporting uh, regime. Um, and I just wonder how many of the respondents were the chief financial officers uh, of the organisations, um, because of course you guys have got the, the kind of the hard work of, of having to uh, implement it. So my job is to try and kind of get out of the detail and do the kind of uh, high level hand wavy bit, and just to sort of say, well, what's the prize here? What are we, you know, why are we doing, why are we doing this? Um, because that's really where the value is of it, right? Because if we just remain uh, kind of thinking of it um, in you know, as a first instinct, and because it is a, a compliance regime, we actually don't get full value out of out of it at all, uh, really. Um, and we're just kind of going through a reporting exercise. And I think we would all be worse off if that was the the level that we kind of stuck with it at uh, here uh, as well. Um, I know some of you will have heard me say this uh, this story, tell this story before, but. Um, I'll say it again because I think it's kind of pertinent now we're at the sharp edge of this. Uh, but where I first came across this uh, was when the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures was launched uh, at a side event um, in Paris as the Paris Agreement was uh, kind of being negotiated uh, in 2015. So I was over there as a... I was in the opposition then and I was over there as an observer of the process uh, which meant that I couldn't go into the negotiating rooms, which meant that I kind of wandered around and meandered into interesting side events. And I thought, oh, you know, Michael Bloomberg and Mark Carney are doing something. I'll go take a look at that. And one of the things that struck me uh, that um, they they were saying was that they're, in their view, uh, having done by then a couple of years' worth of work on it, that there were trillions of dollars of trillions of dollars, uh, American dollars, uh, of um, unmeasured, unquantified uh, uh, risk sitting on corporate balance sheets. Um, and for Mark Carney, who at that stage was the governor of the Bank of England, you know, from a whole system perspective, that's terrifying. You know, if you've got all of these corporates sitting out there who just actually don't even realise the scale of the risk that's uh, sitting on their, on their balance sheets. And in his view, and in, in Michael Bloomberg's view, uh, you, you know, the more you can surface that so that management, um, uh, you know, directors, shareholders, analysts and so on can, can see it, uh, the more you're going to um, be able to have effectively uh, businesses that are able to um, kind of, free, you know, when you free yourself of that risk, actually kind of focus on where the opportunities are. So I know that, uh, you know, not every, I mean, I took a look at the list of who's in the room. Not all of your companies are actually obliged to be doing this reporting. Which, and so it's great that some of you are interested in doing it, even though you're not obliged to do so. But for those of you who are obliged to do so, one of the things that I keep thinking is it's actually not about you, right? It's about um, everyone else in your value chain. Uh, and to me, that's where the, uh, <laughs> that's both where the risk is uh, and, and where the opportunity is as well. Um, and so, you know, obviously the events 
given that we're here in Auckland, uh, the, the flooding over, ironically, Auckland anniversary weekend, um, those extraordinary uh, rainfall uh, patterns that we saw in that very, very short period of time, followed two weeks later by Cyclone Gabrielle, um, which I know had less of an impact here, but has been just extraordinarily devastating for uh, Te Rafferty and Hawke's Bay, um, gives us a sense of some of what it is we see when we when we kind of go through these scenarios and we go through some of the, especially some of the physical risk uh, components here as well. And I know that many of your uh, businesses, and in fact many of your employees, um, will have been affected uh, in some way, at least peripherally, uh, by those events. So as we sort of start to see that, not because we've had the experience of it, but because we're actually able to forecast it and we're able to kind of see uh, how these things play out, to me, that's where you start to say, um, you start to be able to look for opportunity, right? You start to say, well, you know, I don't, I don't know what business you're in, but uh, that there will be conversations that you're able to have with some of those organisations that you're involved in, in whatever stage of the value chain you are involved with them in, uh, to be able to say, well, how might we work together so that kind of both of our businesses are better off here? Are there additional products or services that you need uh, or different arrangements that we can have in terms of how we work together uh, that are going to be able to lift us up um, and, and kind of you know reduce that, uh, reduce that risk? But every time you reduce risk, there's probably an opportunity that's attached to it, right? There's a sort of a new avenue there uh, for uh, for the business to go down. Um, and so I just wanted to, um, and I know I'm sort of talking in generalities because that's going to look very different for every one of your uh, for every one of your businesses. But I think that's. Uh, really where we want our heads to be at. This is really good management information that we just didn't have before. Um, and uh, yes, we're asking you to report, um, but that's that's not with the value. The, the value isn't in the kind of being the public, you know, being publicly accountable for it. The value is to be able to discover uh, what's kind of sitting in there um, that you can actually say, well, here, here's an opportunity for us to, to reduce risk, but actually here's some opportunities to work with our value chain in new and exciting ways that we hadn't anticipated before. And I think that, you know, most of the people in the room are CFOs, that you're, um, for, for you, uh, you're the kind of point of discovery, Right, you're the, you're the person who's going to be looking at that and kind of responsible for that process of, of developing it. The other thing that I wanted to say about this is, um, you know, it can seem pretty daunting, right? And there's a lot to it. Uh, and I can't remember who it was that just said um, that, uh, you know, in some ways this is more complicated than financial reporting. It took financial reporting a really long time to evolve, right? Generally accepted accounting principles as we understand them now were what were not what was published on day one a uh, hundred years ago. Um, you know, that, and, and that's been a constant process of, of evolution um, and actually of, uh, you know, businesses, the, um, the audit and assurance sector, uh, the regulator um, agencies and so on, all working together to kind of say, well, what's working, what's not working, what would be of more value, where, where can we simplify things, where can we... Simplify things when the Americans complicate things. You know, how, how do you kind of how do you manage uh, all of uh, all of that um, kind of process through? And so, you know, I don't think anybody is expecting, and I'm certainly not expecting perfection on on day one because we're all learning together. And uh, while it's really exciting that we're the first country in the world to implement mandatory climate-related financial disclosures, with that you've got to take a certain amount of view that when you're the first and you're kind of making it up, well, you are making it up because nobody else has made it up before. Uh, so, so in that sense, uh, just kind of getting into it is you're learning stuff about your business, but you're also learning stuff about the system as well. Uh, and so I would just really encourage you to, um, you know, continuously provide uh, feedback through, you know, Toy2, who uh, you're working with, uh, or back to the external reporting board, um, or um, back to uh, government, not me, um, but um, me, uh, you know, who, in, in order to say, well, you know, this bit seems kind of over cooked for what we're trying to do. On the other hand, there's another area where we're a little worried, but it seems pretty thin. You know, that's going to need fleshing out. All of that's really useful information because we are kind of developing a system that's got to be good for New Zealand, but also 
good for the world because uh, there are a number of other countries that are moving on this pretty rapidly. The UK's got legislation in place. They're working, uh, <coughs> you know, they're obviously massive in scale compared to us. Um, I think there's something like 36 uh, other central banks um, who, like our central bank, uh, are looking at some form of regulatory regime, uh, you know, uh, in their uh, places. The SEC is looking at it for the United States. So, so you know, the fact that we are the first and that we've actually got a regime kind of up and running and that, you know, we are sort of starting to test it in reality in the coming uh, year or two uh, is tremendously exciting because it actually does mean that we can sort of provide our experience to the rest of the world um, and try and help to shape what the standards look like uh, for uh, other OECD countries as well. And hopefully over time you'll have a, a you know, like we do with generally accepted accounting principles, a sort of broad global agreement about what that looks like, even if there are kind of nuances at the at the national level. Um, and so we're all part of that. And I, uh, I guess I'm saying thank you uh, for participating in uh, in that uh, in that journey because it is, I think, uh, uh, one of those kind of rare and brilliant moments where New Zealand is leading the world in the domain of climate, and we are making a contribution to the rest of the world by leading on it. Um, and to me, that's um, that's pretty exciting. Um, and so uh, before we get into the Q&A, the last thing that I just wanted to say was that I do hope uh, that uh, you, uh, your families, um, your uh, businesses, your communities have not been too affected by uh, either Cyclone Gabrielle or um, the events in Auckland uh, and Northland a couple of weeks before that. They were uh, obviously... Um, kind of catastrophic uh, events and several orders of magnitude more severe than anything that we've seen before. A couple of weeks ago I was down in Pukatapu Valley in the Hawke's Bay, which is, uh, you know, if you haven't been there, it's one of the ones that you would have seen on the news. Nothing on the news can prepare you for what it's like when you're actually physically on the ground. So the piles of silt there are, not piles, but it's, it's because it's even, so there's no piling. It's just the the the, the valley is caked, layered, uh, in in silt that's over my head, you know, and that the um, you know the houses there are kind of buried uh, through the first floor. Um, as they clear the silt, they're digging out cars and caravans and things like that, and having to check them and make sure no one was in them at the time, um, which is kind of pretty horrible work. Um, but the scale of it is just so extraordinary, you, you cannot imagine it. <clears throat> and and the orchardists that I was talking to, um, who's, you know, their orchard's completely um, done, um, and as are the houses there, but they, they were saying that they they were there, they, they managed to move into the Pukatapu Valley a year before Cyclone Bola hit, so their timing was great. But they were saying that there was about eight times as much rain in this event as there was in Cyclone Bola. Eight times, not 20% more, but eight times as much rain. Um, and in Cyclone Bola, it rained for three days, and here it rained for three hours. Right? So you had eight times as much rain in three hours as Cyclone Bola had in three days. And Cyclone Bola left about 10 centimetres of silt uh, across the valley floor, and this left a metre and a half. Uh, so, you know, again, several orders of magnitude, magnitude greater. And I know that, you know, I was talking to Sean um, at the back of the room about just you, for those of you who were watching or in the rains that kind of came down in Auckland, that just the sheer volume of water that fell out of the sky in such a short period of time was unlike anything that we'd seen before. And so the, I guess the, um, the thing that we need to think is that that's sort of the new baseline, right? So that's those are highly unusual events, and there were other things going on to do with, you know, other kind of non-climate change related climate um, kind of patterns and so on. But everything compounded because what happened is climate change added to those other patterns uh, and created those events. And what that means is that essentially every event from here on in gets exacerbated in a way that's not linear, right? Um, and, and so everything that we do is critically important. That, that's why this work uh, is so important, and that's why kind of these scenarios and kind of really digging into the, uh, this uh, is so significant. It's not because, you know, we're looking backwards and saying, 
you know, if you look at the history of risk to our company, what does that look like? It's looking forwards and saying, well, where are things going? And recognizing that the worst weather you've experienced recently will be some of the best weather that you'll experience in the future. Uh, then that kind of gives you a sense of why this, uh, why it is so important for us to kind of dig into this, and not just for our own companies, but across the whole uh, the whole value chain. So thank you very much for embarking on this journey with us. Like I do really, really appreciate it, and I do really value the contribution that you're making, not just to your own companies, but to the country and to the world uh, by extension uh, and being a part of it. Thank you very much. Nōrēra, up, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Kia ora, James. Um, thank you for bringing uh, some of that to life for us, uh, reminding us that the standards uh, aren't just there as another mandatory compliance regime. Uh, they're there to help us uh, to understand and quantify uh, climate-related risks um, uh, to then be able to um, uh, put the right mitigants in place, but also uh, in understanding what our risks are. Out of that comes potential opportunities, which comes innovation, uh, which helps us to hopefully uh, mitigate and meet some of our climate goals. Uh, so understanding our risks and opportunities, um, developing metrics and targets around those, uh, making sure that we've got the right governance in place and a robust uh, climate strategy is, um, I guess, the main purpose of today. Uh, and um, on that note, I'd like to invite our speakers back to the uh, floor for some Q&A. Uh, please note that all of the slides will be available, um, so we will circulate those to everybody who registered for today. And if you do have, we, we're probably going to run out of time, uh, but if you do have questions that go unanswered today, whether you're online or in the audience, um, we, we will provide contact details um, so that you can ask the questions after the event and we will get back to everybody uh, to respond to those. Okay, anyone in the audience with our first question? <laughs> Portia, over here. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, folks, and thanks for those presentations. James Flexman from Mercury. Um, James, you asked a question, and the, or you offered to take some feedback and some suggestions, and I have a little bit um, really true about what we saw over the events of the last few months around the, the extent of the um, weather events we haven't seen before. But one of the things that's really challenging many sectors, I think, is the lack of good climate data, climate science data. And I, I'm at Mercury New Zealand, a, a hydroelectricity generator. We own big dams. Um, but along with other colleagues and, and there's councils, there's water care um, in, in Auckland own big structures that, that dams. What we don't have in New Zealand, our colleagues in Australia have much, much better information on this than we do, is good quality data to know what the extent of these future rainfall events or storm events are going to be so that we can assess the risk and know how we can mitigate or adapt our assets to ensure there are no flow on disasters from things that could happen, mm -hmm. such as dams breaching and things like that. So it's a, I guess it's a challenge you know, as, a, as, a, as a minister in the, gov in the government. Um, the likes of NIWA, Met Service, I guess, and those sort of entities have access to information that's probably behind a paywall of some sort. They've probably been engaged by private entities to do some work, but it's just not available to everyone. And I think that's a real that's something that we'd love to see you help us with to get better data and um, access to that. Yeah. Great, thank you. So you, you won't be surprised to learn that that's not the first time I've heard that. Um, uh, um, and it is, it is something that I am working on. It does involve changing the way NIWA and others are funded, uh, which is why it doesn't happen quickly, um, because it's a whole kind of business model and it involves a number of kind of awkward conversations with Grant. Um, so... So that is something that, that we're working on. One of the things that I'm trying to discern is the extent to which, I mean, we have loads of data in the country. It's just atomized in, in different places is how we draw that together. Um, but the other bit that, I'm, that I don't actually have quite a good handle on, and it's because the information that we do have is atomized, is, is where are the actual gaps? So what, what data sets are we, as a country, are we missing? Um, but it's going to be hard for us to discern that until we get all the data that we do have into a single place that's accessible for people. Thank you, James. Uh, anyone else from the floor? Uh, we've got a question online. 
Yeah, we've got one uh, for the XRB. Uh, disclosing things that might happen in the foreseeable future may not be appropriate where commercially market sensitive. Uh, how do you expect businesses to comply with that requirement? Yeah, it's a really good question about commercially sensitive information. So we are taking the line the same as the TCFD, which is if it is commercially sensitive, in your view, you know, disclose what you can. Disclose at the level of granularity that you think is appropriate and look to disclosing more over time. But obviously, you know, if there's something that's highly commercially sensitive, you know, based on your, your advice internally, you know, based on maybe advice from your, your legal team, if it's a merger and acquisition or something happening, you probably, you know, you wouldn't disclose it. But again, you know, if you're a listed entity, you've got to think about those listing rules. Um, very much, you know, the disclosure regime is asking on those current and anticipated uh, impacts and financial impacts, what is apparent in your current reporting year? That's what we mean by current. And then what is coming up potentially in the future? It is never going to be you know, my future anticipated impact from climate change is $37.9 million, exactly. You know, it's going to be ranges, it's going to be estimates. But again, you know, it is about you making that judgment about what is appropriate to disclose. And I, yeah, really agree with Austin. You know, we've always been saying this is a journey. You're going to get better. I absolutely expect high quality reporting from day one. I want people, you know, to put the effort in. But I think the sophistication of the reporting is only going to change and improve over time. Thank you. Simon Haynes from NICO. Um, so firstly, a great set of presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two sort of comments slash questions. First is around assurance. Um, I think one outcome that is quite important is that we get a sort of equivalent capacity of in assurers with the number of reporting entities. So you don't have capacity to do, I don't know, 500 audits, but have a 1,000 people that need to report. So my first question is sort of how are you kind of making sure that we get that outcome? Uh, and then the second totally unrelated question is uh, just around sector uh, climate change analysis scenarios. Um, I'd just sort of point out that they are being created by private groups, so we don't know quite how public they will be. Um, I personally support them being made public, so uh, questions about how we sort of push that and then make sure they get updated at the right kind of frequency. So there's my two. Right, so I'll go for the assurance question. Um, we're very mindful of the need to build capacity. So from a standard setting perspective, that's been at the core of our objective. And we've gone out to all practitioners who are active in the space going, how can we support you? And that's why we are actually recognising two different international standards, recognising that there's, that broadens the market. We are also aware that the assurance providers are preparing at mass and scaling up. So we've done what we can from a standard setting perspective. Also allowing a little bit of a delay enables that capacity to grow. So I hope that answers that question. Um, and yeah, on the sector level stuff, so totally agree with you. I want this to be as transparent as possible. So we are, you know, we are directly contacting the leads of these projects saying, we want to host them on the XRB website. We really want that to be publicly available information. Um, we can't force that to happen. Um, but what we're hoping is, you know, it's, it's a snowballing type effect. You know, once some sectors see that there's a, there's a up and others are like, where's mine? Why is, not, why is this not available? We're, we're hoping that that, that helps there. Um, I, I would also say, yes, you know, lots of the sectors are obviously getting consultants to help them to do it, but we are very, very clear in our encouragement that that process, we think, should also be a very open process. So we're encouraging when the sectors do it, 
include iwi, include um, NGOs, include you know your users, and include people in it because it's that diversity of thought that gets a significantly better outcome than that closed shop. You know, this shouldn't be a product of external consultants. It should just be external consultants facilitating, you know, the thinking. Um, and, and yeah, in terms of how often should they do it, uh, it is not a one and done type thing. It's not a one and done type thing either at a sector level or at an entity level. It really is, you know, are there sign I, I, people might not do it every year, but are there significant things that change that, you know, you might want to then rerun it or, or you know, have different driving forces or, that you're interested in or a different focal question that you're interested in? And that can help, you know, keep it live and, and moving over time. Thank you. We've got time for two more questions. We've got one here, and we'll have one more online. Thank you. Uh, look, thanks very much for the presentation today. It's been awesome. So I guess two uh, two points. One's for, for James, and, and they're all linked uh, together. One of the really important things, uh, sorry, Richard from Zestry, um, one of the really important things we're reporting is having stability and having a clear picture of what's going on. Uh, and that, that really means that we also need stability from a government perspective on policy and changes. And we saw some big things happen with carbon this week and carbon auctions, which starts to make me worry about how, what more can be done to give us stability for reporting going forward from a government perspective so that we know what to report on, because it's quite hard when things go bump like they did. And then it's from the XRB, when there are things that are moving like they just have, how on earth are we supposed to do great scenarios looking forwards? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I mean, I, I always favoured a... Um, the, when, the, when you look at the emissions trading scheme, I've always thought of it a bit like monetary policy and then all of the other things that we do as fiscal policy and the more you do of one the less you have to do of another and the inverse is also true the less you do of one the more you have to do of the other right um and 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 ideally those two work really well in concert but it's government so they don't um <clears throat> so um with in line with that thinking i have always thought <clears throat> that the Climate Commission should set rather than just advise on things like ETS unit supply settings. Because once Parliament has agreed what the emissions budgets are, your ETS unit supply should actually be fairly algorithmic, right? Because you kind of know what the box is that you're playing within. So it should just kind of follow uh, what, what the supply settings are after that. Um, having said that, new information does emerge like that varies that. So um, the rate at which... Uh, afforestation is occurring is a variable which means that um, that affects the kind of decisions around how many units you auction for for example or if a large industrial was to kind of come out of the free allocation system well that is another variable so you do have to have there, there is a level of variability year on year that you kind of need a system that is able to kind of tack with circumstance um, but um, yeah I, yeah I mean, I, you would have read in the papers that I wasn't overly delighted with Cabinet's decision uh, last year, um, and, and th there is a set of consequences that are associated with that. Um, so uh, that's something that I'm going to be taking back to the Prime Minister to say, well, is there another way that we can do this? Because you can, see, you can now see what the consequences are of, of doing it that way. Yeah. And yeah, how do you do scenario analysis when things like this change? Um, so the scenario analysis is designed to be exploratory and about plausible futures. So you could absolutely put in a scenario analysis exercise that you think it is highly plausible that, you know, climate policy goes to hell in a handbasket and, you know, nothing happens or that there's heaps more stuff happening. You know, it's not about predicting what is going to happen. It's really about stress testing those extremes to say, is my, is my business model and strategy going to work well under, imagine a world where X happens. Imagine a world where Y happens. It is not about saying, this is what's going to happen and my, my strategy is going to work well, yes or no. Um, so again, but it's, it, to, you know, to the earlier question, how often do you do this? You know, if you did a scenario analysis exercise and then five years later you haven't done another one and the world kind of looks quite different, 
you might really be wanting to to refresh that. Um, but it, yeah, it's when big things happen, it's not going to affect the scenario analysis really, because that is just about exploring those plausible, you know, extremes. Okay, I think we had a question here, and then we'll go online. Thank you, and thank you for the session today. It's been um, very, very helpful. Uh, Jenny Sullivan from Air New Zealand. Um, in some cases, the technology is ahead of the methodologies and frameworks that businesses need to rely on for their disclosures, uh, say the greenhouse gas protocol, for example. Uh, what advice do you have for the organisations that are investing in those technologies and don't have the benefit of guidance uh, from the Greenhouse Gas Protocol to inform their disclosures? I'm going to hand this to Toy Toy to answer. Thank you. That's a very good question. Thank you very much for asking. <laughs> um, I think it's... Uh, I think it's one of the cases where you're bringing in a lot of professional judgment in some cases, right? And um, often if that's a technology that you're not the only, you know, if it's not a proprietary exclusive technology, there may well be others who can give you a little bit of guidance there. But I think at the end of the day, if you're open and transparent and honest about here's, here's our best effort at that, uh, if you're open and honest and defend, you, you defend your methodology, you're not really going to get scrutinize for that and then as new as the as the standards catch up because you're right they do often lag behind um, as they catch up or they get sort of addendums or anything like that then you just you're shifting at that point but there's not really ever a sort of a blame game that you didn't predict what the standard was going to say they do tend to be at that sort of particularly at that level the you know greenhouse gas protocol iso they tend to be that sort of you know lowest common denominator what did everyone in the group agree on and so there's always scenarios that you can't predict or that aren't clearly delineated there, but you can use some of the guiding principles and then I think lean on some experts who like, ah, eh, this is sort of similar to this other technology. Let's maybe use some of those principles. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Austin. And final question from uh, online. Yes, we have a, um, an attendee online going through their first carbon audit with Toy2. Uh, part of the information requirement was for audited financials. How do we align the carbon audit periods with the financial reporting periods in this case? Does this mean a lag in reporting carbon information? In addition, how much can the financial auditors rely on the work of the carbon auditors? This could result in a double up of work undertaken by auditors and also lead to higher audit fees. Thoughts? It's Misha, I think, or Andersana. Yep. That one's the first. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, auditors do have a lot of different methodologies that we can use. In most cases, we've come across the carbon reporting measurement period is aligned to the financial period. So um, we don't expect to see differences there. Uh, if there is a slight lag in your carbon period, you could use assumptions to try and get your carbon information in the past. You could make assumptions of how it will be for that period that you need so that they can be aligned. It also depends where the financial auditors and the carbon auditors are working at the same time. Our audit methodologies and assurance standards does allow us to perhaps rely on other auditors' work so we could implement those strategies. So we'd have to assess on a case-by-case -case basis and see what is the scenario or what audit work we would do. I don't know if you've got anything to add. The only thing I'd add is we regularly get asked that question and we are thinking about developing guidance, particularly about reliance on experts as well as reliance on other assurance practitioners. It's not unique to this environment. It's, it's also done in financial statement audits where you've got a group auditor relying on a component auditor. So the principles exist. It's just that we might need to add a bit of guidance in this context. So hopefully that helps. Kia ora koutou. Uh, thank you very much for that and for um, all of your participation today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the corridor. Uh, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the slides will be circulated. Uh, and if you do have any further questions uh, that pop up, uh, please feel free to get in touch. We'll make sure that we circulate uh, our contact details as well. Uh, in the interest of sustainability, if anybody would like to take some kai home with them, uh, there's a fair bit left on the table, so please help yourselves. Uh, enjoy your Friday and have a 
wonderful weekend. Thanks again for coming. See you later.